Um, my name is Ada Nieminen and I am the governance officer at the Psychologist Association and I will be moderating today's webinar. And thank you for everybody for joining us for Psychology of Active Living, an evidence-based guide for psychologists on implementation strategies for clients in physical activity. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the Psychologist Association of Alberta and our affinity partner, Go Get Fit. Uh, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, we'll just go through those right now. So this webinar is recorded and will be available for you after the event is complete. Um, for questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen um, and you feel free to pop the questions in there anytime. Um, and you can also chat with your fellow participants in the chat box or if you have any comments or concerns for the PAA team, we're here to help you. Um, we have three wonderful presenters today, but first, the Psychologist Association of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that Alberta is located on treaties four, six, seven, and eight territory of traditional lands and traditional gathering places for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, Stony Nakoda Sioux, Sotu, Siksika, Pikani, the Kainai, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda First Nations, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. The Psychologist Association of Alberta is dedicated to ensuring that the spirit of the Treaty 4, 6, 7, and 8 are honored and respected. So today's webinar will be kicked off by Dr. Peter Rollick. Uh, Go Get Fit is the vision of Dr. Peter Rollick. Um, he's an ER physician who daily witnesses the first-hand impact of lifestyle modifiable disease burden on patients, healthcare providers, and healthcare systems. Dr. Rollick has previously worked as a trauma leader in the, univers in, in the University of Alberta, a STARS flight physician, and a rural medical director. He has an emergency room. He has been a, an emergency room physician for 25 years. Dr. Rollick's athletic experiences include being a member of the Canadian badminton team, a national level masters athlete in the Nordic ski racing. In the latter, he has finished in the top 10 of world championships and taken home medals in the Canadian championships. And I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Rollick, who's going to start today's presentations. Thank you, Ada. Thank you, thank you for the uh, introduction. Thank you for um, this um, opportunity to be here to talk to you about something that's very dear to myself as a physician. And um, I'm gonna go and start with a screen share here so we can go and uh, get started on this. Um, let's kind of go down over here too. Can everybody see my screen all right? That is it good? Yes, looks great. Okay. Um, exercise holds uh, a well-deserved place uh, as an adjunct therapy in the struggle with depression as it does with a lot of other forms of um, um, medically related illnesses that have lifestyle modifiable disease burdens. The mechanisms underlying the positive impacts from exercise are becoming clearer and clearer especially when it comes down to uh, depression and exercise. With respect to the brain, mental health and exercise, there's pathways uh, to the antidepressives effect of exercise via neurotransmitters like serotonin, noradrenaline, we, we know well of these. The neurotrophic uh, peptides, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic uh, factors, these are becoming a lot clearer. There's also the noted changes in the brain anatomy with the hippocampal uh, volumes and serum oxidative stress mark, uh, markers that, uh, that mark dam uh, brain damage. They're associated with exercise and participation that these are decreased. With respect to inflammation, exercise has, seems to target uh, that low level inflammatory states that are associated with depression and stress. The story around depression and inflammation, uh, the association between uh, autoimmune uh, activation markers for example, the IL-6, the, uh, the tissue uh, uh, neural, uh, uh, neural fact, uh, factor alpha, it's all well documented. But the story of depression and, um, and the inflammatory pathophysiology goes even deeper. Pro-inflammatory cytokines upgrade 
tryptophan metabolism generating um, uh, the um, kinourine uh, uh, pathways and products um, and influence the, the dopamine signaling key receptors that we know of. But there's also this thing that we call the gut brain access and focusing on the G its permeability is where exercise has uh, has a big impact and we'll, we'll address this uh, in this uh, talk that we're gonna be having today. Aren't we lucky to have an adjunct to all that we do in medicine and in, in, uh, in mental health as uh, depression uh, and uh, as, as exercise has the impact on depression? But there's an elephant sitting in the room here for us. And that elephant is that basically despite all that we do with knowing and all that we know, we know that basically trying to get people started, there is a barrier here, a challenge. And that, that challenge is what, is what takes us into the area of looking at, um, at the effects of uh, how do we get people started? When we know that from uh, this study here on, in the ACTA uh, uh, physio, uh, phys, uh, Physiatry Scanda uh, paper that this systemic review Systematic review looked at the anti-inflammatory effects of major depression, and um, uh, and the with major, with respect to major depressive disorders, and it showed that unequivocally that in five out of six of the uh, of the uh, or uh, five six of the paper of the um, of the uh, reviews that they looked at, that there was a significant impact of anti-inflammatories on on depression. For us. We we have the we have a, a new way of doing business in this. And out of this 2019 article, what it did is it it looked at the endurance training uh, increases in a very key piece of um, of muscle physiology, looking at the expression of a gene, the PJC one alpha gene, a, a regulatory gene that that is uh, impacted by physical activity. What they showed with this was that basically by people becoming physically active, there's increased expression of this gene and it increases the, in the, mito, in the cells, it increases the mitochondrial density so that you start to burn more um, uh, fat and uh, adipose uh, free fatty acids. It, it's heavily involved in the preservation and protection against neuronal loss. It's, um, it, it, has, it has an impact on um, the uh, inflammatory and in, in reduction of inflammatory uh, mediators, uh, looking at IL-6 and, uh, and tissue um, uh, at TNFA alpha. And then also it interferes with the mechanisms that reduce oxidative stress. The big thing here is that uh, it, has a, um, it has a significant impact on the peripheral uh, conversion of uh, kine, uh, ur urine uh, to kinuronic acid, which does not cross the blood brain barrier, which does not have the impact on decreasing the, uh, increasing the, um, the uh, um, inflammatory effects within the brain. In the end, what it does is it decreases it, it, activity, decreases depression by this mechanism. We know that uh, recurrent stress and, uh, and the impact recurrent stress has on uh, having recurrent uh, depression, especially when that recurrent stress becomes chronic. But what we do know is the is the, is the, the brain the uh, the gut brain access is a key mediator of why we see uh, inflammatory changes. In looking at these papers, these papers all talk towards that gut, that uh, that gut uh, the um, gut brain access and the signaling and how it, how it affects the body. The main thing I'd like us to look at here though is that look at the, at the impact of, of, the, um, uh, of what happens at the gut and why we see inflammation when we do have depression and what, how depression mediates that. What depression does on the right here is it decreases, it, it cuts down the, the uh, junctions that are between the cells and allows a lot of uh, proteins, chemicals go into the into the uh, number of uh, that uh, into the blood, and that causes that is one of the causes of the inflammatory component that we see. What exercise does here is exercise rebuilds these structures and uh, increases the uh, the tight junctions so they're well regulated, so that you uh, and this is in conjunction with or through 
the um, the uh, small chain free fatty acid compositions that uh, that exercise does drive forward. In the end, we know that the gut brain access is that the is one of the key mediators for for why the brain is healthy and 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 one of the key, key pathways for exercise to be effective. I'd like to take a switch here, and, uh, a slight shift here, and looking at at what what the studies tell us about um, about exercise and about uh, the association of um, of why people are uh, or what the what the impact is within communities. This study here went and looked at uh, the uh, the first. It was the first meta analysis in 2019. It was published, and it was it was study to compare the the antidepressant effects of aerobic activity and the treatments of depression, excluding. Um, exercise activities. So it was comparing it to other modalities, but not exercise. What they looked at is they looked at specific populations that are, are quite common, a referral population that we look at is between the 18, the ages of 18, 25. And they recruited people that were specifically in this study, which was different from all the other, uh, or I should say all the other reviews that they've done. They looked specifically at populations that were recruited from mental health services that, that um, and not from media advertisements like all the other meta-analysis meta that were done previously in looking at populations. So they excluded those that, were, that came through media advertisements. What they found in that was that in leaving in subgroup analysis is that there was comparable effects for um, aerobic activity with, uh, within, those, within each of those populations such that they delivered a significant impact on uh, that uh, of a relationship between exercise having an impact on major depressive disorders. Let's look at that a little in a little more detail. When you look at the um, at the at the at the different types of exercise that can be done, this paper um, uh, in 2018 looked at at one specific part of exercise resistance exercise training. That's doing a squat or doing a curl with a weight resistance training. What they looked at here is they wanted to see the impact um, and, and they found that there was quite a significant impact on depressive symptoms. But here's what's unique about this. This wasn't about, this had nothing to do with the amount of exercise you did. You could just do one set of three of, of three uh, sets of uh, any number of repetitions of one exercise, independent of your health, independent of the, of the change in strength, the depressive symptoms, it had a significant impact on depressive symptoms. Equally, when you look at fibromyalgia, the, the resistance, uh, they looked at resistance in aerobic exercise and they found that in, in the, uh, the meta-analysis of the randomized controlled trials they looked at, that it reduced, uh, that it markedly reduced pain, it improved global wellness, and health and uh, related uh, quality of life. And the biggest effect was on the evident symptoms of depression. We come down to basically the, as I said, the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is how do we get people from the chair or from having intent to get them to go and start to go and take action. And I found that this was quite instructive in looking at the motivating factors and barriers towards exercise and severe mental illness, the systemic, the systematic review of the uh, literature. In this meta-analysis, they looked at severe mental illness and they uh, looked at, they wanted to first ask a number of questions from, or look at a number of questions to be answered from this population. They identified that this population knew that exercise was important. And as a quote from the paper, they, they that, Patients with severe mental illness appreciate the relationship of improved health as a reason for exercise. They knew it, but what was the problem? Well, we know that the motivators were, were definitely a good way to get started, is that people wanted to look better and feel better. That feel better was that mood was important for them to be a starter. But what about the barriers? The barriers here were that no, most notably was that the lack of support was identified with 50% of the participant of the of the people of the um, people that they that they uh, studied in the system, systematic review was that 50% of this population identified that the lack of support was the greatest barrier to their wanting to participate when they walked out the door and they were back in the community on their own. And I'd like to ask this question to leave you with this. 
why do we continue to go and give people information, tell people they should start, and yet we don't support them in the community when they, do, when they want to start, when they walk out the door, and then they come back defeated again. Dr. Valina Wright, you're on. Thank you, Pierre. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to pop those in the Q&A box. Um, and like Dr. Rolex said, uh, Dr. Valina Wright, you are up next. So Valina Wright is a board certified gynecologic oncologist at Leahy Hospital Mer and Medical Center, a part of Beth Israeli Leahy Health. Uh, during more than 25 years of clinical practice, she has been named a numerous times to Boston's Magazine's annual top doctors list. She is the director of gynecologic oncology at Leahy Health and Medical Center, as well as the director of the AAGL Minimally Invasive Gynecologic Surgery Fellowship. Her passion for helping women uh, avoid cancer and their treatment and know their treatment options and regain their health uh, inspired her first book. It's time you knew the power of your choices to prevent women's cancer. And it was published February 18, 2021. She's dedicated to elevating the quality and safety of healthcare for women throughout excellence in clinical practice, education, research, innovation, and advocacy. Dr. Wright, the floor is all yours. Hi, thank you, um, Ada, for the introduction and the invitation to speak. You may wonder why a gynecologic oncologist is speaking to psychologists. And I think it's because of some of the frustrations I have as a GYN oncologist trying to help women overcome some of the barriers they face in the challenges of dealing with a cancer diagnosis, which in many situations is related to comorbid uh, disease. So this is a this is an older graph. It's um, from the World Cancer Research Fund, but it basically estimates that one third of cases, cancer cases in economically developed countries, are related to being overweight, obese, sedentary, or poor nutrition. And obesity has surpassed smoking in risk for healthcare costs. We know from this data that four in 10 cancers could be prevented. And so you have to wonder, well, why, why don't we? One uh, note about this slide is that now in the United States, COVID-19 death is the third most common uh, cause of death. So that certainly has had a huge impact on mortality um, in our country. But if you look at both heart disease and all cancers, we don't code for obesity as a cause of death, but it's linked to both cancers and uh, cardiovascular disease, which are the number one and two causes of death in most developed countries. So when women are, are healthy, communities thrive. And unfortunately in gynecologic oncology, the most common cancer that we treat, and we don't treat breast cancer to exclude that, but we, we treat uterine cancer and that's linked in more than 50% of cases to obesity. The incidence of obesity is three to one ratio of women to men. And if you look at a time interval from 1988 to 2016, there's been an increased incidence of type one uterine cancer that correlates with the uh, increase in the obesity epidemic. So in women, most uterine cancer, less than 5% of cases historically occurred in women before menopause, but now that's up to about 10%. And overall, the incidence in women being diagnosed with uterine cancer under age 45 has increased 14 fold. If you look at women in the perimenopause between age 45 and 54, there's been a 63 fold increase in the incidence of, of this cancer. And for women over 55, it's a 50 fold increase. In addition, the age of uterine cancer, the median age used to be 63 and that's increased to 61. And it's significant because a lot of women are being diagnosed now at an age where they haven't yet had their families or completed childbearing. Next slide. So of all the uh, cancers, um, this is a, a UK study that looked at 5% of all cancers in the UK population. Uterine cancer correlates linearly with obesity. 
And I know this talk is about physical activity, but we really have limited da data about physical activity and the gynecologic um, cancers. But this uh, article that's published in the New England Journal by Karen Liu uh, this past year is a summary of uterine cancer. And we know that for every five units of BMI, we get a 50% increased risk of type one or obesity related endometrial cancer. And for women's cancer, it also applies to breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colon, and um, not so much lung cancers, but some subtypes. But you can see how the impact is so strong for uterine cancer. So in our society, the Society of Gynecologic Oncology, um, an international society, they attempted to address this by introducing the SGO Obesity Toolkit. And its goal was to educate both patients and physicians about how to have difficult conversations related to obesity. Um, in addition, physicians were asked to ask permission from their patients if they wanted to address this or have a discussion and then to set goals and monitor and to have it as part of our survivorship programs. Despite this being introduced more than 10 years ago, we've really had no progress made in the ability to treat obesity, which is recognized as a medical disease. And as we all know, is multifactorial and very difficult um, to treat effectively. The other problem that we have, try, have had trying to do this, and we've worked with Go Get Fit app trying to introduce it for some of our uterine cancer patients, is the stigma that's associated with obesity. Some of our doctors in, in enrolling patients or trying to address this end up being reported to patient advocacy if it's not done uh, with empathy and with the patient's um, willingness to have the conversation. So I'm sure we're all aware, aware of the stigma of obesity. And if you look at this uh, particular study, 58% of obese patients have faced teasing discrimination. Um, and it's a disproportionate number of women relative to men. The shame and blame method we all know is ineffective. And it's also associated with depression, anxiety, low self-esteem and eating disorders. In the research that we've done, most women are unable to address obesity until they've dealt with the underlying emotional issues of depression and anxiety. <clears throat> and often what happens in, despite our best intent, some of these women drop out of healthcare and they find that the sources and uh, stigma comes not only from family members most commonly, but more than half of their doctors or half of the patients reported doctors as being, being the ones uh, with the stigma. In the US, in some of our community hospitals, they will not do elective surgery on patients with a BMI over 40. And so that certainly has contributed to access to care and other um, issues in patients receiving the care that, that, that they need. The next um, slide I show, and we can play the video, I just wanted you to, to prove that I really was a surgeon. <laughs> but this is a, a video that shows how we've advanced technology in treating uterine cancer in doing a sentinel node biopsy and converting these surgeries from an open surgery, which would often land patients with comorbidities of obesity, diabetes, hypertension into an ICU for wound infections, abscesses, and wound dehiscence. We no longer see that now that we're using this technique of minimally invasive surgery. In addition, we do sentinel node bi biopsy where we use a fluorescent probe to ICG with an infrared camera that will help us identify the node most likely to contain cancer and avoid a full node dissection. And again, that decreases the morbidity of lymphedema that can really impact people's ability to be physically active. The other important point is that if patients are in the ICU and end up intubated and, and paralyzed, they lose 3% of their muscle mass per day, which is really significant to recover from. So by doing minimally invasive surgery, we're able to shorten their time to treatment um, such as radiation or chemotherapy rather than have them have a prolonged recovery. The next slide um, is to focus on what's known as sarcopenia or loss of muscle mass specifically related to aging, but can also occur out of proportion to aging. 
Sarcopenia affects your gait, balance, and overall ability to perform daily tasks. Um, what is interesting in the gynecologic oncology literature is if we measure the psoas muscle and take measurements here, it's being used as a predictor for prognosis and part of fertility indexes and has a really uh, significant impact on overall survival, survival rates. So research is focusing on other causes of sarcopenia besides aging, a reduction in nerve cells that send signals from your brain to tell your muscles to move, lowering of your hormone levels, and a decline in your body's ability to convert protein to energy. And obviously nutrition is part of um, our ability to maintain our health and our muscle mass. And again, the main treatment pathway for sarcopenia is exercise. And researchers have identified, as Dr. Wallach mentioned, that resistance training is the specific form of exercise most beneficial to people with sarcopenia. And the training is designed to really improve muscle strength and stamina with use of resistant bands or weights. So this is a, a meta-analysis or summary of the use of physical activity in cancer prevention and survivorship. And what studies show is that people with higher recreational physical activity, especially post-diagnosis, have an improved overall and disease-free survival for bladder, breast, colon, endometrial, esophageal, real, renal, and gastric cancers. Most of those cancers do have obesity as an associated risk factor, which tends to uh, couple with sedentary lifestyle. The greatest physical activity was associated with decreased all-cause as cancer-specific mortality for, can for uh, clients with both breast, colorectal, and prostate cancer. And the risk reduction is up to 40 to 50%, which is obviously very significant and often not controlled for in many of the trials that we do on, on drug therapy and other interventions. The one study that I found specific to uterine cancer was actually performed in Alberta, Canada. And researchers looked at 425 women who were diagnosed with invasive endometrial cancer between 2002 and 2006 and observed for an average of 14 years up until uh, 2019. It was an interview administered lifetime total physical activity questionnaire recorded pre-diagnosis and then a median of 4.4 months after diagnosis and post-diagnosis physical activity was assessed. The results showed um, that over the course of 14 years, there were 60 deaths, including 18 uterine cancer deaths and 18 disease-free survival um, events. The important take home was that higher pre-diagnosis recreational physical activity was statistically significantly associated with improved disease-free survival, but not overall survival. The participants who maintained high recreational physical activity levels from pre to post diagnosis did have improved uh, disease free survival as well as overall survival compared to those who maintained lower physical activity levels. So recreational physical activity, especially post diagnosis, even if you had not been active prior to diagnosis is associated with improved survival in survivors, improved survival in survivors of endometrial um, cancer. What we do know about physical activity and life tra trajectories, we know that at any age, women tend to be less physically active than men. And as uh, our age increases, our physical activity in general tends to decrease. For women, having children is also associated with a midlife period of decreased physical activity. What's sad to know, in the United States, only 17% of Americans meet the American Cancer Society guidelines for physical activity. Um, so there's a, a huge opportunity to have in, uh, impact by doing uh, studies and research to try and help patients become more motivated to achieve the benefits of physical activity. So, we did a, a study at Leahy looking at uterine cancer patients that were going to be candidates for the laparoscopic robotic surgery, as there's really no restrictions on physical activity. 
that procedure is now a day surgery and patients do not require bed rest. So we had hoped that we would be able to capture um, that cohort of patients over the last uh, year. And we had more than 68 women that qualified, but we only had 10 that signed up for the study. And there's various reasons for that. Some women um, weren't approached by their physicians. One of the physicians accruing patients got reported to patient advocacy for even discussing obesity and physical activity. And so again, I think that just highlights the importance of uh, medical education um, so that we as physicians understand the impact and benefit of physical act activity for our patients and are able to have these conversations in a way that's meaningful and helpful and supportive for our patients. In addition, workflow issues with our current uh, system would have to be changed. And it's always very hard to make change in any medical system where time is always uh, an issue for our, our patients. Um, and we ended up incorporating it into survivorship programs. And with the use of the app and also with the pandemic, with, with telehealth, we were better able to have patients um, be interested in physical activity and potentially sign up for, for, for the app. So when you look at um, you know, where we make an impact as physicians, Clinical care really is only 10% of our, over, estimated to account for 10% of our overall health. Social economic factors, 30 to 40%, genetics and biology, 10%. Health behaviors though are up to 30%, which is why I think it's important for me to be here today and speak to the psychologists, because obviously uh, you are very well trained as a society to help, help um, our clients deal with uh, behavioral change meaning physical activity and addressing some of their inherent risk factors. Um, what's interesting today in uh, Dr. Wolf published life expectancy in the United States, uh, comparing 2018 to 2020, life expectancy had been decreasing prior to this. And again, it was thought to be due to comorbidities of obesity, inactive lifestyle, nutrition. But they published that between 2018 and 2020, the life expectancy decreased from 79 to two years to, to 77. That's the greatest decrease in life expectancy in a developed country since World War II. And unfortunately, it's not surprising, but there was also racial discrepancy in that decrease in life expectancy with African-Americans life expectancy decreasing 3.6% and Hispanics 3.9%. So again, it confirms some of the uh, biases that are built into our system, access to care. And in the US, we're, we actually rank number 41 in preventative healthcare. So there's lots of room for improvement. And I'm really privileged to have the support of Dr. Rollick and uh, the use of his app for our patients. I think the challenge is being able to find ways to support our patients better and implement um, programs that will really impact their health. And again, as a GYN oncologist, when I know that many of these cancers could be prevented, it's, it's really sad when we see young women in their 20s and 30s now being diagnosed with uh, uterine cancer, um, not just the diagnosis itself, but the morbidity and impact it has on their quality of life. Women with uterine cancer are actually four times more likely to die of heart disease, of cardiovascular disease than they are of uterine cancer. So I think you know, my goal was really to highlight how much um, comorbidities have an impact on our patients and their quality of life. So thank you uh, for your attention and time. Thank you, Dr. Wright, that was very insightful. Um, thank you for all the questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we will get through those at the end of the panelist discussion. Um, I will now turn it to Dr. Kayleen White. Uh, Kayleen completed his honors degree at the University of British Columbia, his master's and doctorate degrees at the University of Manitoba, his pre-doctoral internship at the Calgary Clinical Psychology Residency. Uh, and in his private practice, Kayleen provides individually tailored evidence-based interventions for a broad range of difficulties in adults and adolescents, including those related to general psychological functioning like anxiety, depression, chronic pain, 
trauma, emotion regulation, self-esteem, and life adjustment, as well as those in specific to performance difficulties like focus, motivation, perfectionism, dealing with failure and loss, managing performance, expectations, uh, navigating challenging team dynamics, distress tolerance, goal setting, and time management in both uh, sport and corporate clientele. In his personal time, Kaylin enjoys spending time with his friends, family, beekeeping, camping, hiking, running year round. He also competes and completed a variety of ultra, ultra marathons and ultra endurance obstacle races. And Dr. White, if you please. Okay, thanks very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Volume's on? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so my role uh, in this in this discussion is really to talk about the, the how, so how to do it. So this is going to be kind of a guide for uh, you psychologists on the front line for how to actually get clients more engaged in physical activity. So uh, just to start off the conversation, um, uh, I want to go back to kind of psychology 101 here and, and provide you with a basic framework for understanding um, the lack of physical activity or uh, avoidance of, of activity. And what we're going to talk about here is the approach of avoidance conflict. So this is, uh, we're going back away here to some of the basics, but this will at least give us a framework for, for having a discussion about how to actually work with this. So when we're talking about the approach avoidance conflict, um, we're talking about really the behavioral paralysis that results around exercise that results from uh, two main factors. One is the, the drive to engage in exercise is low. So um, there's a low approach drive, um, a tendency to kind of want to do exercise or be motivated about or have the discipline around the exercise, um, actually doing it. And there's also a high avoidance uh, anxiety around like the distress of doing exercise. So, uh, so we're talking about on the one hand, the drive is low to approach exercise and the stress about exercise is high. Um, and so what we want to do just uh, in a very basic way here, and again, I'm, I'm talking uh, in a, as a general framework uh, in terms of tackling the approach avoidance conflict and actually getting people more engaged in exercise is on the one hand, maximizing the approach drive. So the drive to actually engage in exercise and minimizing the avoidance, uh, the anxiety that, that kind of repels people from engaging in those behaviors and those exercise behaviors. So what are some of the factors that can contribute to avoidance of exercise? This slide is intended to be overwhelming, so <laughs> I've crowded it full of stuff. Uh, depression, burnout, sleep deprivation, uh, anxiety of all kinds, generalized social illness, anxiety, life stress, work, divorce, relocation, grief and loss, poor time management, disease and illness, injury, personality factors like neuroticism, openness to new experiences, pain, whether that's chronic, like I have a headache today or uh, or sorry, uh, like long-standing uh, pain issues or acute things like I have a headache, trauma, PTSD, low self-efficacy, lack of experience, like I don't have a track record of engaging in exercise, so I don't have that experience to draw on, lack of knowledge about how to do it, lack of resources. So um, Dr. Relic talked about how this is a big one, right? So um, people just generally do not have the support. They don't have the money. They don't have the resource to actually engage in some of these exercises. That's a big one body image concerns, right? So the stigma associated with that. Uh, adverse childhood experiences, genetics, and uh, everything including the kitchen sink, like it needed cleaning today, so that's why I didn't go and exercise. So everything in the kitchen sink can affect why people don't exercise and don't engage in more physical activity. So in the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna talk about how to solve all these things. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, of course. Your clients are complex. There's lots going on. Humans are complicated. Their problems are complicated. And so to address this at a kind of granular level, it doesn't really make a ton of sense to do in the next you know, few minutes. But what, I, what I'm going to do is touch on some of the uh, two of the main factors that we want to look at when actually getting people more likely to engage in exercise, exercise behaviors. So two of the main sources that I'm going to focus on um, for engaging or low engagement in physical activity are the lack of drive. And I know it sounds almost like judgmental framing it like lack of drive, but this, what I'm really talking about is low motivation and discipline, like the inclination to engage in behaviors. There's a, there's a low amount of that to overcome the factors that I just talked about. And I don't know why it says number three, but anyway, the second factor is high psychological stuckness. And what I mean by stuckness is the belief that behavior, like our behaviors are actually fused to our thoughts and feelings. So if I feel a certain way or I think a certain way, then I can't engage in behaviors uh, that are incongruent or different from those thoughts and feelings. So that psychological stuckness is uh, the second source of uh, low physical activity engagement. So I'm going to address each one of these in turn. 
So starting with, uh, as part one, starting with the, the addressing the lack of drive, let's talk about how to actually do this. And the first thing is really to provide a very solid rationale to people for the benefits of exercise. So as, as we talked about, there are tons of benefits of exercise. And some of the main ones that I often talk about, it affects the endorphin and anandamide function. So anandamide is an, is an endocannabinoid. It's a, it's a compound that's produced in our body as a way of kind of regulating uh, lots of different systems. But what it does is it works in conjunction with endorphins to produce a state of kind of non-wanting, non-craving. So it, it helps with mood, it helps with anxiety. Uh, exercise influences cortisol function. So cortisol being the stress hormone. It helps with the anti-inflammatory effect in our brain. So as Peter um, talked about earlier, um, it, it has this anti-inflammatory effect when we engage in exercise. Uh, it improves vascularity or blood flow to the brain and the body. So it promotes learning and cognitive function, um, focus and attention, right? All these things are improved when we get more blood to the brain. It promotes longevity and reduces illness. Um, so as we just heard, right, there's lots of disease uh, that can be prevented if people are engaging in exercise. Uh, and it just generally increases the lifespan. And the important thing is we know as psychologists, um, behavior actually creates emotion, it influences emotion. So um, exercise will actually create motivation. Uh, so behavior shifts emotion. This is something I'm gonna talk about in more detail shortly. But what you wanna do as providing that rationale is actually give them a really impactful statement about what the role of exercise is. This is really the wonder drug that everyone is searching for. So. Um, feeling better, less stressed. I'm not saying it's going to fix everything, but this is the kind of thing that people are really after and it's there if they want it. So if you care about having positive feelings, then the idea is to go and get them. And specifically, if you want motivation, then you have to go get it by engaging in the exercise. So I know it sounds like I'm overselling exercise, but I think um, kind of on average as psychologists, we undersell the importance of exercise. And, and as we know, this has a, a serious impact, a positive impact on, on well-being. So we should be selling this hard in this way. But the question is, okay, but how do they do that? So how do clients actually engage in activity? Well, the important thing is to recognize that drive is a function of motivation and discipline. So if you don't, you don't have to have both. You don't have to have motivation and discipline, but you have to have at least one. And when motivation is there, it's relatively easy to engage in exercise. When clients are motivated, they know how to do it. Generally, they will be inclined to do it and they, and they will follow through. But what if motivation isn't there? And this is getting into the kind of brass tacks of how we actually engage in activities that we're not motivated to do. In this case, action hinges on discipline. And what I usually say with clients here <laughs> is I say motivation is utter garbage. Um, and it's not entirely true. Um, Motivation isn't garbage, but I usually say that as an impactful statement just to get clients unstuck from the idea that motivation is everything, which is also untrue, right? So motivation is not everything. If you don't have motivation, then it's about discipline. And what discipline really is about is following a code or system of behavior, right? It's about adherence to a system of behavior and uh, following through with that. So what we do here, or what I do with clients, is I help them create and then engage in their code of behavior. And the code of behavior is, it hinges on values. So what I have them do is I have them identify their core values and values are things that kind of bring your life a sense of purpose or meaning. And then I have them identify how exercise behaviors specifically serve those values. So it's a two-step process that I engage in. And what I've actually included with the package that we'll be sending out to attendees is actually, it, I gave you two worksheets that you can use uh, that coincide with these two steps that you can actually do the values work with your clients. So the first step is actually completing a values clarification exercise where you have the person identify their core values. What is most important to you in your life? What brings purpose and meaning to your life? And having those really clarified is, is critical for the next step, which is where you translate those behaviors to very specific, um, or sorry, translate those values into very specific behaviors. And in this case, the behaviors would be like, Act, uh, physical activity, right? So specific exercise activities. And what they do in that um, step is they link the exercise behaviors to their core values. So the first function of doing this values work is like I said, to actually establish a link between the specific exercise behavior and the client's core values or the things that bring their life purpose and meaning. So I'll give you a, an example here of what that would look like. So if a person values being a good parent or a spouse, 
um, then they could, you could brainstorm with them a specific exercise behavior that they could engage in. So for example, spin, like going on the spin bike from Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays for 30 minutes at 7 p.m. That's a good smart goal, right? Specific, measurable, and so on. And then what you want to do is create the link between that behavior and their value. So uh, how it serves the core value. So in this case, well, exercising and getting on the spin bike will improve my ability to be emotionally present for my family, my wife, my kids. It's also demonstrating or modeling good stress management skills for my kids. So that's what that serves in terms of that, um, that value. Another example for, for some people, it's like financial security. That, that's what I really value. I want, I want money and I want to be able to have like some financial security. Well, going for a brisk walk every morning at 6, 7, uh, 6 a.m., how does that serve financial security? Well, it'll improve my cognitive performance. I'll be more kind of switched on. It will improve my average performance at work. It will improve potential for job promotion. It will reduce you know, the number of days that I miss. In terms of presenteeism, it'll make sure that when I am at work, I'm actually switched on and doing the work that I'm supposed to be doing. And it will boost my retirement savings in the long run because I'm actually making more money and I'm, I'm more present at work. So um, the idea here is not to create a link that's so obscure and weird that they can't relate to it. You have to be able to make something that's you know, persuasive and that they can buy into and actually make sense logically. And you want to make sure that that connection is solid in their mind. The other function of the values work, so this is the second, second function of doing this, is to promote client ownership of the exercise behaviors. So clients are sick of hearing that they should exercise, right? Everyone is telling them you need to exercise, it's good for you. Um, most people are tired of hearing it and there's a big guilt component associated with that if they don't do it. What you wanna be doing through this values work is really remove all the variables, including you from the drive equation, like why they're doing it. So in their mind, this is not about their psychologist, this is not about their physiotherapist, this is not about you know, anyone else telling them that they should do this. This is about me living in accordance with my values According to my identity, my character, I'm doing this for me. Okay, I know I'm moving through this pretty quick. If there's any uh, questions at the end, for sure, I'll be open to those. I um, just want to make sure we kind of keep it fairly simple, and I'm kind of, I know I'm going through this fairly fast, but I um, hope this is all making sense. Okay, part two is addressing the cognitive emotional behavioral fusion. So what this just means basically is our tendency to see behavior is fused to thoughts and emotions. So one example of how this works in, in people's thinking is, well, I feel tired, so I can't go for a walk. I feel anxious, so I can't go to the gym. Um, I should have exercised yesterday, but I didn't. So now I feel guilty, stressed, and upset, and so I can't exercise today. So there's this idea, right, that we, we have a thought or an emotion that's present. It's not congruent with this activity, and so then I can't do that activity. In reality, there is no necessary, like, there's no necessary connection between those things. So I came up with this little cheesy <laughs> uh, catchphrase this week. The fusion is an illusion. And all that means basically is that our thoughts um, and emotions are not necessarily fused with our behaviors. And what we want to do is start promoting behaviors and, and giving people tools to actually engage in behaviors that sometimes are not congruent with the thoughts we're having or the feelings that we're having. So what we want to do here is use kind of blends of some different techniques. Um, don't engage with or make meaning of the thought or feeling. What you want to do is acknowledge the thought or the feeling, um, label it, diffuse from it, and then act. And you're not pushing away those thoughts or feelings either. You're just basically taking them for the ride. So people who are familiar with um, mindfulness and ACT therapy, this will kind of ring true for you. Um, in terms of some of these strategies, what you are doing is you're basically teaching a client uh, to engage in mindful awareness of their thoughts and emotions and um, diffuse from them. So um, you might have the client say to themselves, okay, there are thoughts here, there are thoughts of judgment. Um, I know there are words kind of rattling around in my brain, I'm just noticing words, right? And then act, right? So you're, you're taking um, the step of actually engaging in a behavior that sometimes is not congruent with the thoughts or the feelings that you're having. You can even go more, like more rudimentary in terms of what the person's experience is. You can even have them say, these are just elect like biochemical electrical signals, right? That my, my brain is interpreting as words or as thoughts. They are utterly meaningless. They don't have to mean anything. I can have these thoughts. I can have these electrical signals and still engage in going for a walk. So basically what we're getting at here are just strategies for diffusing from thoughts and emotions so a person can actually act. So an example of the application, is I know I should exercise. 
This is like the client's automatic thought. I know we should exercise and I feel guilty for not exercising. And then the new trained response is my brain is judging and now I'm lacing up my shoes. So they're just noticing their experience and then they're engaging in the first step. Another example is I'm too tired. This is gonna be painful. So then the new trained response would be my brain is worrying. There's a pit in my stomach. There's heaviness in my body. So you're just mindfully noticing what's there and I'm going to the closet to get my coat. So in this, there's this idea of the power of and. It's not pushing away your experience, it's taking it with you. I'm tired and I'm going for a walk. I'm depressed and I'm rolling out of bed. So you're not getting in a tug of war with your brain. You're teaching the client to befriend their brain, to understand how it works, to accept that it's gonna have these thoughts, these feelings sometimes, and to lean into that and take it with them. You want to break this down into ridiculously simple steps in terms of the thing that they focus on as a way of breaking paralysis. Break down the exercise behavior into its first and simplest step. Lace up your shoes, lean forward off the couch, put down the remote. And if you want to tie it to that value again, do it for your kids, do it for yourself, do it for your longevity. Um, you want to break this down into the simplest thing that they can focus on just to get the ball rolling. If you think about having to go for a long walk, you're just gonna be paralyzed if it's just too much to think about. Last couple of points and then I'll wrap up here. So as part of this, you wanna train self-compassion. So difficult things are hard to do. Like, duh, obviously, these are things that people are not used to doing. It can be hard to break these patterns. So be compassionate with yourself. That will make it easier to actually do if you're, if you're having some compassion. It's not about not judging yourself. If they judge themselves, that's fine. What you want to do is meet the judgment with compassion. You can't tell the brain not to have those thoughts. If it has judging thoughts, that's fine. What you want to do is respond with compassion. You push yourself really hard. You're very critical. You're hard on yourself. Take it easy. And then again, use that mindful approach. Don't engage. Don't reject the thoughts. Just mindfully acknowledge them. My brain is judging. Breathe, let go, relax, refocus. Last slide, and this is kind of uh, out of order, but I just wanted to put this in. Around the idea of like regret, guilt, procrastination on not having done this up to this point or not having exercised yesterday. Um, what you wanna do is just have them recognize it's irrelevant. What is done is done, what's in the past is over. The best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. The second best time is now, right? So you wanna have them again, getting diffused from things that are out of their control that are in the past and engage in the present moment and move forward. So just to quickly summarize these two points that I went over, you want to increase the client's personal drive to exercise by establishing that biochemical rationale for doing it. Sell it really, really hard. Cultivate the discipline, not just motivation through values clarification. Connect specific exercise behaviors to their core values, but bring purpose and meaning to their life and have them establish ownership over that. So there's no one else that's part of the equation, but them. And as a second part to reduce the anxiety, you wanna enhance that diffusion. You wanna break the illusion that thoughts, emotion, and behaviors are all fused together. Um, you wanna to cultivate those diffusion strategies through mindful acceptance. You wanna break the task down to its like painfully simplest steps and then have them focus on the first step and then enhance that self-compassion around judgment, guilt, and self-criticism. Okay, sorry, I know I went over a lot there. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully it all landed. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. White. Um, I will now turn it back to Dr. Rolick. Uh, he will talk briefly about the Go Get Fit platform. And after that, um, we will turn the question and answer moderation to Dr. Judy Malone, who is the CEO of the Psychologist Association. She will also do some thank yous and a wrap up of the event. But right now, Dr. Rolick, go right ahead. Oh, you have to unmute. Sorry about that. Kaylin, uh, sorry about that. Uh, Kaylin, I, I can see why Dr. Wright told me I should be talking to you while we're developing this app over the uh, last uh, year before we, uh, well, when we launched with the PA. I want to thank you for an excellent, excellent uh, um, demonstration of how we should get people started. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, <laughs> the dilemma we have is, is this, is that between getting people started and getting to go and actively participate, there is a gap in between that. And that's that's the thing that I, I see as the, um, 
as the, the problem is to how to get them started. Everybody knows the benefits. They walk out knowing the benefits. And it's about how we get that bridge to go across. We went, we looked at this in 2015. We did a complete pivot from what we were doing previously. We did a complete, uh, de a detailed review of the behavioral sciences and the mental health literature looking at behavioral change. Uh, brought an R&D team together. And that's what we, uh, that's where this application that we are, uh, where we've been involved in looking at uh, has has been uh, what we rolled out. We knew that there were two things that were important. We, and the literature, as I, I identify as one of the papers, is that um, having mood um, as a reason that people start, but also mood as a reason, uh, as not only a motivator, but as their mood as uh, being how they continue, why they will continue to participate is important and having it, and that's we've in, in our, uh, what we designed into the application was to look at keeping those two paired really close together for patients. But equally, we know that uh, in a, a very, very important piece is that when somebody is successful when they, and that they're being recognized, that virtual touch uh, remotely is, is, a, is a very important piece to establishing a sustained continuation of wanting to go and, and participate in, in, their, in their behavioral change and new lifestyles. But there's a problem here. One-to-one -one supporting the community, we, don't, we do not have the time. I know as a doctor, I don't have time. I know from talking to teachers, they don't have time. And I can, uh, from talking to a Judy and from the uh, psychologists I've talked to, none of us has the time to manage hundreds of people. So for the, what in the technology, what we realized we had to create was a solution that allowed us to scale up and, and uh, scale up that research so we could go and we could be successful. So you can go and you could support people, hundreds of people, and it only taken a couple of minutes uh, a week to go and accomplish that. And that's basically what, what the technology is about. I'm keeping this really short right now because I would like to go and hear about the questions and, um, and let's, let's move forward with that. Thank you, you guys. Thank you, Dr. Raleigh. Thanks. Do you're ready Anna. to go? Yeah, it really, it alludes to, you know, there's so many questions that we're not even gonna have time to answer today, but the wealth of information that's here. And so I'm so delighted with everyone who's joined us, but more importantly, that this is recorded. So this is gonna be a resource. If there was a lot of information, we can go back to it. We can get that information um, again from the recording and, and please do share that uh, widely. It's to benefit everyone. So I'm gonna just try and touch a couple of the questions, see if we can get in a couple before the end. So one was um, for you, Dr. Wright, what was that percentage risk increase for uterine cancer of a five unit increase in BMI? The participant just missed that. Yes, so for every five um, BMI units that are increased, so say you went from a BMI of 30 to 35, you increase your uterine cancer risk 50%. So obesity is a, a really important role in our risk for uterine cancer. And many women are unaware of that. There are surveys done that many women are completely unaware of the link between obesity and cancers. Yeah, and pretty stunning data, really, really. Um, so just sort of watching the time, what I want to do is just touch on what some of these questions were. So we, we know what the participants were th thinking about. So one is, about implementation or strategies when you're dealing with people who might have histories of eating disorder or very rigid punitive exercise regimes. That's probably more uh, Dr. White kind of question. Uh, there was one for Dr. Rollick about limited to no support for people to carry out that physical activity and what supports are most useful. And of course, there's also um, were some reflections and, and questions about using BMI could be or perceived as judgmental for some people. And so ways to reframe that, that would really then engage the clients quite a bit more. Again, it's, it's one o'clock. So instead I would encourage you to follow up with us if you have questions and you've watched and we will certainly share it and get information for you so that the presenters don't have to deal with those individually. We'll post this as soon as we can. It's just a tremendous 
resource. But I do want to sincerely thank each of you. Uh, Dr. Valina Wright, thank you for taking the fantastic angle in your um, presentation and what you bring. Sobering for many of us too, which is really good. Uh, Dr. Peter Rock, love working with you. This is an excellent resource and we're really hoping to have that merge and, and really benefit Albertans and Canadians in really good ways. Um, as we all will. And uh, Kaylin, or sorry, Dr. White, your expertise is always very appreciated. Excellent presentation. And your sports psychology workshops are very popular as well. So that does bring us to the hour. Again, I thank everyone for being here. And on behalf of uh, PA, we were delighted to have this resource available to members and to the public. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.